Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Pediatric Grand Rounds. Our speakers are all virtual today, and probably most of our audience is virtual. So just the usual reminders from me, if you haven't learned it over the last three years, to make sure you're muted and use the chat feature for any questions or comments that you have. And we will be looking at the chat throughout the presentation and definitely at the end. I'm going to turn things over to Drs. Donna Denno and Dr. Grace John Stewart to do the rest of the introductions and take us through some learning today. Thanks so much, everybody, for being here. Thank you for being here. I, I think I'm starting out by just telling us a little bit about Global Watch. I just wanted to say thank you so much for the opportunity for us to present here at Grand Rounds. Global Watch is a center that's really interesting in that it's founded between three departments, the Department of Pediatrics, Global Health, and Obstetrics and Gynecology. And the reason for that is that we actually think about three populations sort of together and try to think about what it means to integrate the health of women, adolescents, and children and use a life cycle perspective to do that. So really thinking through periods of pregnancy, postpartum, the first thousand days of life through childhood, the transition to autonomy, and then from adolescence to adulthood. And in the center, we have a variety of scientific priority areas, including a focus on gut health. And I believe last year, our team on gut health presented here, a focus on family planning decision support, and then finally, a focus on co-infections through the life cycle. And that will be the focus of our talk today. So I'd welcome any of you who are interested in Global Watch to collaborate. We do collaborate with a lot of members of the Department of Pediatrics. And as you can tell, between childhood and adolescence, there's a lot of mutual interest that we have. Uh, and I will pass this on to Dr. Denno. Thanks so much, Grace. Um, so for those who don't know me, I'm Donna Denno. I'm faculty in the Division of General Pediatrics. And also, I am the uh, lead in Global Watch for the Department of Pediatrics. So um, it is my great pleasure today to announce our two wonderful speakers. So delighted to have them here today. Um, Dr. Irene Injuna received her medical degree and a master's degree in tropical medicine and infectious diseases at the University of Nairobi in Kenya. She worked for several years on the front lines as a physician in Kenya before pursuing an MPH and PhD degree in epidemiology from the University of Washington. Dr. Njuna is currently a research scientist at Kenyatta National Hospital in Kenya, an affiliate assistant professor in the Department of Global Health at UW. She works on optimizing outcomes among children and adolescents living with or affected by HIV. Dr. Njuna has been involved in multiple related studies, including on pediatric HIV vaccines, timing of HIV treatment initiation, incentivizing pediatric HIV testing, and transitioning adolescents to adult care. In uh, 2021, she received an NIH Emerging Global Leader Career Development Award to study strategies to improve the school experience for adolescents living with HIV. And Dr. Anjali Wagner completed her MPH and PhD in epi epidemiology at UW and went on to complete a Fogarty Fellowship as a postdoc attached to the Kenya Ministry of Health where she focused on pediatric HIV. Dr. Wagner is assistant professor in the Department of Global Health and serves as director of the Global Watch Graduate Certificate Program and co-director of the implementation science um, area in Global Watch. Dr. Wagner has worked in Kenya for 12 years, including in the area of pediatric and adolescent HIV and implementation science. She's passionate about collaborating with ministries of health to identify and address health system pri uh, research priorities. Dr. Wagner is currently leading a study on PrEP delivery among pregnant and postpartum persons and a study on engaging diverse adolescents in research using respondent-driven sampling and virtual focus groups using WhatsApp. And with that, I will turn it over to our speakers. Good morning, everyone. We are so honored to have the opportunity to present to you all today. I'm Anjali Wagner, and my colleague Arjun Jiguna and I will be co-presenting about global pediatric HIV, diagnosis, survival, and transition to adult care. Neither of us have any disclosures. So today we'll cover our learning objectives, the epidemiology of pediatric HIV, then we'll shift to survival and treatment, and then end with transition to adult care. By the end of today, we hope that you'll be able to analyze global epidemiology of pediatric HIV and issues surrounding HIV testing. 
compare improvements in global pediatric HIV survival in the past decade, analyze approaches to enhancing transition from pediatric and adolescent to adult HIV care, and analyze implementation approaches that are critical to scaling improvements in pediatric HIV outcomes. And throughout our talk today, we'll be talking about pregnant people and vertical transmission of HIV. As a field, we're moving forward in our word choice. We recognize that not all pregnant people are women and that outdated terminology like prevention of mother to child transmission of HIV can be blaming and uninclusive. So throughout this talk, we'll be aiming to use inclusive language, pregnant folks, gestational parent, chest feeding, et cetera. And additionally, we recognize and honor that the research presented is from Kenya where the language used focuses on mothers and terms like prevention of mother to child transmission of HIV have program name meaning. And we thank you for joining us in this nuanced language space. So where do <clears throat> children living with HIV live and how does their care compare to adults globally? Pediatric HIV disproportionately affects Sub-Saharan Africa where approximately 90% of the 1.7 million children who are living with HIV live and prevention of vertical transmission of HIV programs have scaled up massively. And this has resulted in fewer and fewer new infant HIV infections globally. Over the past 20 years, the coverage of HIV treatment has expanded from about 18% in 2010 to 52% in 2021. However, we see that children lag behind adults in terms of HIV testing, HIV treatment, and virologic suppression. In 2021, globally, just 52% of children living with HIV were on antiretroviral therapy compared to 76% of adults. And this inequity with children in beige and adults in blue is present at all of these steps. Globally, just 41% of children living with HIV are virologically suppressed compared to 70% of adults. And we agree with the UNAIDS report that this gap represents nothing less than a global failure to provide life-sustaining care to the most vulnerable within our communities. Now, Irene will explain why diagnosis and treatment are so urgent for children uniquely. So untreated HIV results in extremely high mortality and data from some of our work uh, we've, we've done in our group and others also before HIV treatment was available for children uh, show that 50% of children with untreated HIV will die by the age of two years. With HIV treatment, survival improves. In some of the work our group did, we identified infants with HIV who are less than five months old and initiated them on treatment. As shown in the curve with the dotted line, survival was better at 67%, but still very, very poor. And in a landmark study in 2008, uh, this study was on pediatric treatment, and they found that when treatment was started by eight weeks of life, there was a dramatic improvement in survival with 96% of children in that cohort surviving through two years of life. And these studies really highlight the critical need to diagnose and initiate HIV treatment in children as early as, early as possible. So when we look closely at the two treated cohorts we just talked about, the SHA cohort, who started treatment by eight weeks, and then the OPH cohort, which is actually our group cohort, who started treatment at five months. Uh, in addition to the age differences, there were some important differences at baseline. The SHA cohort infants had much better immune function. We see the median CD4 count, CD4% in that group was 35, while the OPH ones, the median CD4 count was 18. And then pretreatment viral loads in the later treated OPH cohort was almost one log higher. And for this later treated cohort, the OPH cohort, there were also important findings in the mortality patterns. As we see in this curve, those infants who are recruited into the study from hospital wards, who are the ones we see in dotted lines, in the dotted line, had a significant threefold higher mortality when compared with those children who are recruited from prevention of vertical, trans of vertical transmission clinics uh, who are shown in the solid line. And this finding remained the same even after antiretroviral therapy or ART was initiated, with post-ART mortality again almost three times higher among those infants who are recruited from hospital. This really just underscores the need for faster diagnosis and an initiation of treatment with children before the onset of symptomatic illness. And from this work, there were two new questions that came up. That came up. The first was, how do we get these children to start treatment early? And what do we do to improve survival among children who are hospitalized? Because majority of the children in Sub-Saharan Africa will actually present late. They will come to hospital. So what do we do? 
to help them survive. And uh, I'll start by answering the second question, and then Anjali will walk us through the work we have done to answer the first question. So at the time we did uh, this mortality work, the standard of care approaches was to manage the prevention, uh, the preventing co-infection uh, once a child is hospitalized, and then once the child stabilizes, then initiate ART. And this was usually around two weeks after stabilization. And with this approach, mortality among hospitalized children was 39%, and it took a median of 14 days to initiate ART in our cohort, but other studies have reported even longer delays uh, initiating ART post-discharge, and then there's accompanying post-discharge losses to follow up in mortality. And so this approach wasn't quite working for these children. And so we, we wondered whether accelerating treatment for these hospitalized children could improve survival. On the one hand, there were potential pros to this approach, including improved survival, faster immune reconstitution, and viral suppression. But on the other hand, there would be potential cons, including immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome, which we call IRIS, drug toxicity, drug-drug interactions, and potential implementation challenges in very sick children. So to answer this question, we designed the PUSH study that was led by Drs. Dalton Omalo and Christian Stewart, where we enrolled uh, antiretroviral therapy naive hospitalized children who are aged between 0 to 12 years. We were worried about potential iris, particularly in the central nervous system, especially related to cryptococcal meningitis. And so we excluded children with any evidence of CNS infection. The children were randomized to receive ART either urgently, that's within 48 hours of enrollment, or within 7 to 14 days. And the primary outcome was, was mortality. Secondary outcomes were iris, drug toxicity, and adverse events. The median age of enrolled children was about two years, and as you can see, these children were severely wasted. The median weight for age Z score was minus 2.3. The median CD4 percent was quite low at 15 percent, and they had very high viral loads. And over a follow-up period of six months, 39 children died, which is 21 percent of the enrolled cohorts. Most of the deaths happened really fast within the first two weeks of uh, within the first two weeks uh, after enrollment. And we were very disappointed to see that there was no intervention effect. Agent antiretroviral therapy did not improve survival, as you can see in the curve, the solid line representing probability of mortality in the agent arm, and the dotted line, probability of mortality in the post-stabilization arm. However, we did not find a difference in the incidence of immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome or IRIS or adverse events in the two arms, suggesting that this approach was safe. Primary results of this study were published in Lancet HIV, and they provided safety evidence for the WHO recommendation for management of advanced uh, HIV in children, which allowed for the initiation of antiretroviral therapy in severely ill children as soon as possible, and particularly to address the high loss to follow up post discharge. And in this study, we also conducted additional work to understand development. We assessed neurodevelopment development in the PUSH study among children who are under five years of age using a tool that has been developed for use in uh, similar settings. This tool is known as the Malawi Developmental Assessment Tool, or the MDAT, which is assembled using locally available materials and can be, can be administered by lay people. And this is a validated tool for use in sub-Saharan Africa. The tool assesses four domains, gross motor, fine motor, social, and language development, calculated as these scores from a reference population. And with just six months of, on ART, it was impressive to see significant improvements in the gross, fine motor, and language domains among children who survived six months post-ART. So throughout the two years of the PUSH study, we had opportunities to critically review gaps in HIV diagnosis from the stories we had of the children who were enrolled, and particularly the stories of the children who died. And this question, whether we could have found them earlier, became really, really important to us and really guided the, key, the next steps and the next studies that we took. One of the things we found out was that almost a third of the children had been hospitalized before, and they, they were either never tested for HIV or they were tested but never linked to care. And then almost two-thirds of them had been seen in an outpatient clinic one month prior to enrollment in the PUSH study. We also learned that we missed them largely because their mothers were never tested for HIV during pregnancy, or their mothers were tested but tested negative in pregnancy, but then became HIV positive at some point later in pregnancy or during breastfeeding. Or the child was never tested despite the mom being HIV positive. 
And these insights led us on a research path to find ways to efficiently find these children who are living with HIV. And Angela will take us through that journey. Thanks, Irene. So over the past decades, the prevention Prevention of vertical transmission programs have scaled up just massively. And these are programs that both prevent transmission and also identify younger children living with HIV. And as vertical transmission rates continue to decline and the overall number of new infant infections declines, which you can see in the dark orange on the bottom of this graphic, there's been a demographic shift in the age distribution of children who are living with HIV. Between 2010 and 2019, you can see that the proportion of older children, and that by older we mean age 5 through 14 years, who are living with HIV has increased. And we also know that of the estimated 840,000 children who are living with HIV who are not yet on treatment as of 2019, two-thirds of them were between the ages of 5 and 14. So these are older children living with HIV. So let's step back in time to 2012 and that was the time we were starting this next set of work, a Kenyan national survey estimated that about 1% of Kenyan children age 0 through 14 were living with HIV, and that about 60% of them were undiagnosed. Index case testing were testing the contacts of someone who's living with HIV, so in this case the children of parents or caregivers living with HIV, seemed like a promising approach, as more than half of adults who are living with HIV and in care had untested children. So we asked ourselves, how can we efficiently identify children living with HIV before they become symptomatic? The Counseling and Testing for Children at Home, or CATCH study, enrolled adults living with HIV with at least one child of unknown HIV status between the ages of 0 through 12 from seven sites in Nairobi and Western Kenya. And our team, shown on this slide, assessed the feasibility, uptake, barriers, and yield of index case testing at either home or at clinic for families. Dr. Cyrus Mugo's analysis demonstrated that among the adults who enrolled in the study, uptake of testing was high overall at 70%, and that clinic-based testing was preferred over home-based testing. Of note, 21% of families who were offered testing actually had children with them at the clinic that day who hadn't been tested, and they were able to be tested the same day. And this represents a pretty simple solution to address this large gap. The yield of this testing approach overall was very high, with 5.8% of children testing positive, which is much higher than the approximately 1% national prevalence among children, suggesting that this is a very efficient case detection approach. This was similar to findings from a systematic review and meta-analysis around the same time that noted that index case testing had an average 8% yield. In addition to identifying the high yield of this testing approach, we found that systematizing our ask, that is talking to each parent in the waiting room to see if they had any children who hadn't been tested for HIV, significantly and quite substantially increased uptake of testing fourfold compared to the passive referral system that had been in place prior to this study. So in 2015, we were thrilled to hear that the Ministry of Health was launching a rapid results initiative focused on index case testing and informed partially by the CATCH study. So this nationwide campaign ended up testing over half a million children for HIV, which substantially addressed the challenge of undiagnosed pediatric HIV in Kenya. However, our team knew that there were still gaps in index case testing. When we stepped back and we looked at the population of adults living with HIV, who we talked to in the waiting room, we saw that uptake was actually low on an absolute scale. 86% of adults did not complete HIV testing with their untested children during the study period. So we asked what barriers parents face in testing their children. And one barrier that came up over and over was cost. A participant imagined what a mother might think, saying, I don't have money to go there and I don't have time. Like maybe she's hustling for the meal for the day. So she's like, if I go there, I'll waste time. What are my children gonna eat in the evening? Which reflects real competing financial priorities. We also heard that costs were a commonly cited barrier to testing children, all sorts of different types of costs. So this led us to ask the question, could financial incentives motivate parents to test their children today instead of tomorrow? 
And we hypothesized that parents who were willing to test but who hadn't yet taken action might be motivated by a financial incentive. So we designed a trial called FIT, Financial Incentives to Improve Pediatric HIV Testing. This trial had five arms, one of which was an unincentivized control, and it had incentive values of $1.25, $2.50, $5, and $10. The trial was conducted at 19 sites in Western Kenya, where adult HIV prevalence is high. And we enrolled the same general patient population as in the previously described CATCH study. So these were adults living with HIV who had one or more untested children. And we compared the proportion testing one or more children within two months and the time from randomization to testing. Many of the same team members who are part of CATCH also ran this trial, shown here on the screen. So we use some new tools like randomization scratch cards shown on the screen and mobile money transfer to disperse incentives, which is a technology that Kenya has pioneered. In the trial, our team screened over 22,000 individuals living with HIV and only 2% met eligibility criteria. This wasn't surprising and it's a testament to the really expanded pediatric HIV testing services throughout Kenya. And this strategy might not be a great set, fit for a setting like Kenya right now, but it might be a better fit in contexts like West and Central African region where there are still many undiagnosed children. So in the trial, we randomized 452 individuals and they had roughly equal distribution to the five trial arms. This graphic shows uptake of testing for at least one child on the y-axis and the five trial arms on the x-axis, along with the count and intent to treat analyses below. We found that incentives of higher values substantially increased uptake with nearly twofold higher testing in the $10 incentive arm rel relative to the unincentivized control. And when we considered the time from randomization to testing shown in the x-axis, we saw that incentives of higher values at the five and $10 levels accelerated time to testing between two and two and a half fold. So in both of these primary outcomes, the $1.25 incentive had no effect and the $2.50 incentive had a moderate but not significant effect. These effect sizes are quite consistent with what we see in other financial incentive trials to motivate HIV testing for other populations globally. But not everyone tested their children, even in the highest incentive group. So we came back again to this question of why is testing still a challenge for some parents and caregivers? Children have many unique barriers to HIV testing that are distinct from adults. Children have limited autonomy, they can't self-present for HIV testing, and they rely on their parents or their caregivers to take them for an HIV test. But often caregivers have inaccurate information about the likelihood that an older child could be living with HIV, either assuming that that child must be living with HIV or that particularly asymptomatic children couldn't possibly be living with HIV if they survive to a certain age. So a caregiver in catch shared, there's no way you can stay at home and the child is not sick and you say, let me take my baby to be tested for HIV. Caregivers, many of whom are living with HIV themselves, may be reluctant to test children out of guilt or shame or fear. So another caregiver shared, there was time I brought a uh, uh, the child, but I was told to come back and collect the results and I didn't come back. I was asking myself, suppose the child is a positive, what will I do? How will I tell the child? Suppose they start giving her the drugs, what will I tell this child that these drugs are for this condition? I said no, to hell, the child will know her status later in life. And if children are brought by their parents to a health facility, they may meet healthcare workers who are less confident in providing pediatric specific HIV counseling and testing. A healthcare worker shared, in your mind, you're like, if the test turns out HIV positive, how do I start disclosing to the child? So it's kind of a dilemma and kind of a fear. Do I want to do it or not? So understanding these barriers led us to ask many questions, one of which was, how can we optimize coverage for pediatric HIV testing in busy clinics? And could saliva-based testing help? And I'll note here that we focused on an oral mucosal transidate or OMT test made by Orashore and marketed as OraQuick, which uses oral fluid, not strictly saliva. We collaborated with a sister research team in Zimbabwe led by Chido Chikwari. And on the left, you can see the step-up team in Kenya and the BGAP team in uh, Zimbabwe. 
So both of our teams compared the performance of standard rapid blood-based tests in the Kenyan and Zimbabwean national HIV testing algorithms to the OraQuick antibody test. And of note, all of the tests used in the study were antibody detecting only, with the exception of the Zimbabwean first test, which was a fourth generation rapid test detecting both antibody and antigen. In the Kenyan study, we enrolled children 18 months through 12 years. In the Zimbabwean group, they enrolled children two years through 18 years. And all of the children in the, these two studies were antiretroviral therapy naive. We demonstrated among nearly 1,800 children that OMT was 100% sensitive and 99.9% .9 specific compared to blood-based rapid tests. We additionally found that this test was highly acceptable to caregivers and healthcare workers, and Cheeto's team demonstrated that parents could accurately perform this test on their children after instruction. So with this in mind, we next focused on taking these results forward to hopefully inform policy. Together with our Zimbabwean colleagues, we signed a confidential data use agreement in June of 2019 that allowed us to share data with the, from the study with Orisher. And they submitted these data to the World Health Organization to expand the pre-qualification to allow children ages 2 through 12 to be tested with OMT. And then in November of 2019, WHO expanded their age range, but their indication remained only for healthcare worker administered testing, not caregiver administered testing. So then we had the opportunity to share the diagnostic accuracy data, the acceptability data, and the field performance data with WHO directly. And then the COVID-19 pandemic hit. So in April of 2020, the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, or PEPFAR, issued COVID-19 specific pediatric HIV testing approaches, and they endorsed using OMT in the pandemic context, which led to several organizations electing to adopt this approach. Other teams led large demonstration projects to operationalize and study uh, the use of OMT for pediatric HIV testing in other Sub-Saharan African countries. Last year, WHA reviewed and endorsed the use of OMT for uh, children administered by healthcare workers. But again, they stopped short of recommending caregiver administered testing um, in, its most, in their most recent guidelines. So we continue to work with many others like UNICEF to support the expansion of these WHO guidelines to include caregiver administered OMT. So next, Irene is gonna focus on these children who are living with HIV who are growing up and reaching adolescence. So before 2016, and these are pictures of our teams uh, who are working with these cohorts of pediatric uh, children living with HIV, we had focused largely on children. But around this time, there was a lot of interest around adolescent HIV globally. And uh, this was largely fueled by evidence of very poor clinical outcomes among youth when you compare outcomes to adults and uh, younger children. And also, uh, our children who we had followed up, you know, since 2006, 2007 were growing up and they were getting to their teens. And our teams really wanted to understand what happens next. And this really stimulated interest in our group to study adolescent HIV. So looking at the epidemiology, there's a substantial population of adolescents living with HIV globally. We have about 1.8 million adolescents aged 10 to 19 and 3.9 million aged 15 to 24 uh, who, who are living with HIV. And uh, 15 countries, 13 of those countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, and those are the countries that are shown in, in the dark, darkest shade. Uh, uh, this, this, there are 15 countries and uh, 13 of those countries in Sub-Saharan Africa that contribute to 75% of all adolescents living with HIV. And it's important to remember that adolescent, the adolescents living with HIV are heterogeneous population. They, they comprise of an almost equal population of adolescents who have recently become HIV positive and those who are perinatally uh, infected. Compared to adults, viral suppression among youth is poorer, with an over 10% difference in viral suppression. There's also a very high loss to follow-up, both pre- and post uh, antiretroviral therapy initiation, and losses as high as 30% have been reported. And finally, while mortality in adults and children has fallen over time, we don't see a similar pattern in youth. So this graph here shows mortality trends between 2000 and 2021 among children living with HIV in light green and among adolescents in the darker green. And while we see this big drop in the number of deaths among children, 
adolescent HIV-related mortality has remained relatively stable, even though we know that HIV testing and treatment have rapidly expanded during this period. The period of transition from pediatric-oriented care to adult care has been identified as a critical timeline, and this could contribute to some of these poor outcomes, and some studies have reported poor clinical outcomes after transition to adult services. To successfully transition to adult care, youth first of all need to know their HIV status, and then they must be equipped with the knowledge and skills to independently manage their own care. However, in many high HIV burden countries, there are gaps in these services. There's also very little work done on what outcomes to assess for or, or even tools to support this process. And transition to adult care is further complicated by the varied, varied models of HIV care. So a lot of you may be familiar with models of care where children or adolescents move from a pediatric or an adolescent clinic into an adult HIV clinic, into an adult clinic or move to an adult provider. However, majority of HIV clinics in high HIV burden areas are either integrated clinics where all ages of patients are seen by the same provider or very commonly youth-friendly clinics where these clinics are dedicated day uh, or days per week or days per month specifically for youth and sometimes we'll have providers who have received additional training on youth-friendly care. So in this setting, defining what transition is then becomes a little bit uh, different and maybe even difficult. So to address these gaps, uh, the ATTACH study, which was an NIH-funded study, again led by Drs. John Stewart and Wamalwa, uh, the goal of this study was to address uh, research gaps in transition care. The primary objective of the ATTACH study was to improve the process of transition from dependent to self-directed care by assessing, developing, and evaluating standardized processes and tools, and specifically focused on two outcomes, first, disclosure of HIV status through the, through the, the study and implementation of tools to assist healthcare workers with the preparation, tracking, and completion, and then secondly, <coughs> independent care management skills through, again, preparation, tracking, and completion of transition. And one of the things we were really interested in was to develop a tool that would work in our setting, given all the models of care that we saw. And so to do this, we brought together a working group that was composed of adolescents, frontline healthcare workers uh, who are providing HIV care, including nurses and clinical officers who are equivalent to uh, the U.S. physician assistant. We also brought in pediatricians, adult physicians, HIV counselors, psychologists, and HIV care partner organizations, as well as the Ministry of Health representatives, because in mind we wanted something that could potentially transition to program, program, um, program level. And this working group was tasked to first define what transition means in our setting, define how to define success in our setting, think about how a tool would look like, and also track, and also think about how, how, this, how transition could be tracked uh, from the beginning of the process through the end. To prepare for this meeting, we summarized existing data and transition programs, including from other chronic illnesses. And this included the US-based GOT transition tool, which we thought was a really excellent tool to help think through the steps of the transition process, even though it wasn't quite, all the steps were not quite applicable in our setting. As part of the workshop, we came up with definition of transition for our setting, and this really focused on supporting youth to gain the knowledge and skills required for independent care, regardless of the model of care and some guidelines for when to start transition services and how to define success in our setting. To address key gaps in availability of tools, we developed what we call an adolescent transition package. And this package consisted of a disclosure booklet. This is the first the, the, the booklet named Why Take My Medicine. And uh, this booklet was, was adapted from an existing booklet that was developed and tested in Namibia. And it came with caregiver readiness assessment tools and tracking tools. And then there was also a transition tool that was composed of a structured transition guide, which was called Taking Charge. And this again came with tracking tools and a transition readiness assessment tool. Both of these guides were developed in three commonly used languages in Kenya and were presented in the form of a flip chart or a booklet. The pictures and the designs were all developed by Kenyan artists, and we had youth who provided feedback on the design and also on the language that was used. And we envisioned that the disclosure pieces would be used to start the disclosure process from around the age of six years with targeted full disclosure by the age of 10 to 12 that aligns to the national guidelines. And the transition intervention would be used from around age 15 to prepare youth for independent HIV care. Here's a close-up 
a close-up look at the disclosure piece, which has five chapters. To break down the complicated concepts of how HIV medicine works, the book uses metaphors of body soldiers to discuss CD4 cells and the immune system in Chapter 1, bad guys to talk about HIV virus in Chapter 2, and ARVs or medicine as a blanket that keeps the bad guy asleep in Chapter 2 and 3, some strategies for appearance in Chapter 4, and finally memes the bad guy as HIV in Chapter 5. That's when we get to full disclosure. And this is only done when the caregiver and the child are ready for full disclosure. The Taking Charge Guide consists of four chapters to help you gain knowledge and skills in four key areas. First area is treatment literacy, second is self-management, and then communication and support. The guide includes key educational materials, questions to prompt discussions, and punchlines. And these punchlines were actually a suggestion from the youth. For example, better late than never in the discussion about what to do you forget your medicine, or a problem shared is a problem solved in the chapter on communication. So this intervention was designed to be delivered at scheduled clinic visits by existing healthcare workers, and this was very, a very critical aspect of the study. The study team provided training and supported continuous quality improvement cycles in the first six months, and this was focused on intervention uptake, and then we also collected effectiveness data. The intervention was compared to standard of care, which was a standard visit checklist with a single question on whether transition preparation was done. We tested the intervention in a cluster randomized clinical trial conducted in Kenya among youth aged 15 to 24 years, and this is specifically for the transition intervention. The study equally randomized 20 clinics to the adolescent transition package or to control. The primary outcome focused on the transition pieces and it was defined as the overall transition readiness using an 18-item 18, 18 score that was developed to align to the four chapters in the booklet. We assessed transition readiness at baseline at month 6 and month 12. Secondary outcomes were viral suppression and retention as well as implementation outcomes. We also had disclosure outcomes, but these were all included as secondary outcomes. So overall, for the primary outcome, the study enrolled a little over 1,000 youth the median age was 21, majority were female, and about a third of them had been enrolled from prevention of mother to child transmission clinics, and they had known their status for a median of 42 months. Baseline viral suppression was 83%. And what we found was that at 12 months, as you can see in the graph, transition readiness improved for both arms. The blue shows the scores in the control arm, and the red the scores in the intervention arm. And so you expect to see that increase with increasing time and aging clinic, but we had a significantly greater change in the intervention and even after adjusting for baseline readiness scores uh, that were different at baseline. And similarly, we found significantly higher scores in the HIV literacy and self-management domain in intervention sites compared to the control sites. For a secondary outcome, there was no interve intervention effect on viral suppression or retention. And the disclosure outcomes are pretty challenging to assess, especially because when COVID happened, it became very difficult to, to, to implement the disclosure intervention pieces. Healthcare workers also really liked the tool. In qualitative work, providers liked the design. They liked that the pictures enhanced comprehension and the simplicity of the message that made it easier for adolescents to understand. They also appreciated that the tool helped youth learn about their medicine and that it supported improved outcomes. For example, one healthcare worker said, all I can say is that the tool has made the adolescents to know their drugs. One may forget to come with, with his clinical appointment card, and when you ask to know what medicine he's under, he will pinpoint the drug, and that is very important thing. It has also helped them in appearance, unlike in the past when some were failing. There's some improvement, and we are able to suppress the virus. They are able to suppress the virus, and we are very happy. From the youth perspective, they noted how various chapters help them man manage their HIV as well as, as accept their diagnosis. For example, related to the chapter on self-management, one adolescent noted that information, when I, when I sit down, you know, the more it encourages you and it also gives you strength. For example, sometimes if I forget to take my drug, even if it's by one hour, then I remember that the book says this and this, and it gives me morale, so I go and take it quickly. And another said, personally, this book taught me many things because I, went through the, because I went through the book. I learned that if you follow the instructions well, then you will not have any problems and will even be able to live like a normal person. And so it's been about two years now since the, the, the attached study ended, and it has been very exciting to disseminate the results 
and to share the tools with a wide range of teams in sub-Saharan Africa. And excitingly, the Kenya Ministry of Health is planning to adopt this approach for transition services in Kenya. And we are also in discussions with the Uganda Ministry of Health to work together to adapt and test this intervention in their setting. So this is really an exciting tool, and we're looking forward to see how, how it goes in the future. And so as we come to the end of the talk, to summarize what we've discussed today, we identified that children and adolescents in sub-Saharan Africa are disproportionately affected by HIV and have poorer outcomes compared to adults. We also discussed the importance of early HIV diagnosis and initiation of treatment prior to symptomatic disease. And we also talked through some innovations to enhance HIV testing. And lastly, we shared an example of a co-developed transition tool and its impact on transi transition readiness in, in, in sub-Saharan Africa. So thank you all for your attention. We'd like to acknowledge the study participants who made this work possible, the study teams, the institutions where the research was conducted, and the funders. And we are happy to take uh, questions and comments. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much for walking us through those very exciting series of studies. Um, and if anybody has any questions, um, please enter them in the chat. Um, I believe, uh, Emily, you will be moderating questions um, from the auditorium if anybody's present uh, there. I wondered if the uh, the the information that you gleaned from your the last study that you presented has helped informed approaches that you might take to resolve the barriers that you presented um, in earlier in the presentation about parental concern about how to disclose or what to disclose how to talk to children younger children about their status and medications um, could either of you address that question yes yeah, so so the, the booklet that we developed has become a very valuable tool for healthcare workers because they didn't really know how to start the discussion. And the beauty about that booklet is that the, the, it comes with a caregiver readiness assessment, which is really a discussion with the caregiver as to, you know, what is the family situation, what's going on at home, what is the child saying about HIV, who else has HIV in the home. And that discussion helps them start processing uh, the HIV disclosure, and, and it talks also through like what, what do you think will happen when the child is disclosed to. So that too, I think, is critical to support the caregiver, but then also to support the healthcare workers find a starting point to discuss the, 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 the to discuss disclosure. And then when you look at the booklet, the way the booklet has been has been formatted is that it starts with very simple principles, you know, and 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 it, at the end of the story, you know, the child understands both uh, the immune system a little bit. They understand what HIV medicine is doing and the interaction of both. And this tool, not only, you know, by the time we give it to the children, we were actually giving it to the, to the healthcare workers, not the healthcare workers, the, the caregivers. The caregivers will see the book. It helps with their own comprehension. And I think it also helps with the child comprehension. So I think bringing in that tool was very helpful. And uh, the healthcare workers we've worked with have really appreciated that tool as a way to, to be able to push uh, disclosure discussions. I think that. There's a lot of barriers to, to pediatric testing that, uh, you know, cannot be addressed by some of the things that we talked about. There are families that have so much psycho psychosocial uh, challenges that, you know, uh, for them, they just need uh, much, much more support that could be offered uh, at a program level and those would need individualized support to be able to test their children. The story of where the first book came from, that there was so there were so many parents and caregivers and healthcare workers and adolescents and children who lent their experiences to early qualitative work um, that came years before attached that was done by teams in Kenya and Namibia with Gabriela O'Malley, Kristen Bima Sophie, who did a lot of work to understand what were the experiences around disclosure that people had. Um, some of them were abrupt and bad, and then other ones were gradual and supported. And so developing models of what ideal transition could look like very early on, and then the development of that disclosure booklet and testing in Namibia, then the thoughtful adaptation to the Kenyan context. I mean, there's just been a ton of work and um, a ton of uh, listening to what people's experiences have been to inform what this booklet could be along the way. And a lot of it came from the same, you know, types of stories that we heard in the barriers of what they would like to see happen. Thank you so much. That was a really terrific explanation. Um, uh, quite a different question. The oral fluid-based testing, 
Um, how prevalent is that compared to the blood-based testing? And in what circumstances is the oral fluid-based uh, testing recommended over the blood-based testing? Or vice versa? I might start, and Irene, please jump in with the thing. So the um, AuraQuick test is used for various different things in, uh, in Kenya, various different populations. And the most common use that you'll see it in Kenya and many other Sub-Saharan African countries that have generalized HIV epidemics is for HIV self-testing. And that could either be um, through secondary distribution to partners, so partner testing for partners who are not interfacing with a healthcare clinic, or for individuals themselves to do HIV self-testing either one time or serially. So most of the use of this test is for self-testing by adults. There's some use of testing um, children in the health clinic. I actually have not seen much of this in practice in, in like at a health facility in Kenya. During COVID, it was an incredibly useful tool because people could not come to the health clinics. And many of the gains that we had seen in pediatric HIV testing coverage were being rolled back because of not being able to come to clinics for, for um, common care. So in that case, it was used in a few different countries in this large demonstration project in Zambia, I think Uganda, um, and one other, one other country. Um, and so I, I imagine that going forward, this may be a useful complement in certain contexts. One of them is in a healthcare setting, no one likes to prick a child. No one likes to um, you know, bleed a kid, even if it's just a couple or two. So um, the oral fluid test is appropriate for children over 18 months, and that might be a nice complement, though we haven't um, seen that used as much yet. Um, Irene, do you want to add to that? Yeah, just to add to that, uh, some of the really difficult children to find, of the really difficult children to test are those children who are not living with their parents. So you have access to the caregiver, but you don't have access to the child. But at some point, the caregiver will come into contact with the child. So we thought that this, this test could also be a complement to testing particularly those children. And, and, and as Anjali pointed out, it's, there's quite a number of older children who are not yet diagnosed. So those could also be uh, could also benefit from that test. And then, you know, once if a child, if, if uh, the test comes positive, then, you know, they have to go to the clinic for confirmatory blood testing. So as much as the saliva is, if that's not a confirmatory test, they still have to be tested um, to confirm. I, I, I remembered one other group that it continues to be an interesting group and, and is heterogeneous in different countries, and maybe Irene can speak to this, but children who are in boarding schools or who live separate from their parents who are living with HIV or their caregivers who are living with HIV, those children are very generally hard to reach because they're not typically coming to the clinic during the typical time of year. They tend to come during school holidays or not at all. And so for children who are in boarding school or staying geographically distant, either city or rural, uh, this might be a really excellent complement where you can have that test ready when the child is visiting home with their family and can do a supportive family testing at home. Do you think that the um, Kenya Ministry of Health might uh, put out guidelines for uh, community or home-based use, you know, parental use of the OMT um, in advance of WHO guidelines. I mean, sometimes that does happen, you know, countries lead the way um, and, and then WHO follows. You know, I'm just curious as to um, how you might envision this rolling out, or do you think that um, uh, Kenya will wait for um, in this particular case, um, for WHO guidelines and then adapt from there? I don't know. I don't know. I feel like uh, at, at this point, like the, the, there's still a big burden of children who are untested, but the options available are still good options. And um, um, as much as we would really like this to move forward, I think the WHO hesitation doesn't help, uh, doesn't help, uh, doesn't help make it easier. So, I'm not really sure what direction um, the ministry will take, but it does call for a lot of advocacy and talking about it so that they can move, move it that way. But then the other thing to think about is that, you know, the, tef the tests are available for adults and it doesn't stop an adult from taking it and testing their child. And so there could be a lot of views in the community that we're not quite aware of already. And so strengthening those guidelines might help, uh, you know, to support that on already happening 
Irene, you mentioned that um, viral suppression is lower in adolescents who are on ART compared to adults. Um, I wondered if uh, you could explain that. That was very interesting. Yeah, that's 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 a good question. Yeah, so I think there's a lot of studies that have looked at you know overall viral suppression in uh, adolescents compared to viral suppression in adults, and uh, they they have noted that you know it's it's, it's lower in adolescents. And some of the issues are really around appearance. They, they, if you look at um, if you look at um, uh, there's, there's data showing uh, you know up to thirty percent self-reported non-appearance to to ART in adolescents, and this could be re related to all the things that are happening. You know, they, they feel well, why are they taking medicines? They don't understand, um, they don't really quite understand the risk of not taking medicine. So that, um, you know, the development, they, they're, still, they're still, you know, going through this uh, neurodevelopment, and so they might not really appreciate um, the, the risks and benefits of, of ART. So that's probably what contributes to a lot of the non-viral suppression that we see. But um, we don't do resistant, resistance testing routinely, and uh, resistance testing is definitely an, another, another problem uh, among you uh, because a lot of these kids would have been on, if they were perinatally infected, they've been exposed to so many, many, many other regimens. And so that could also contribute to that. But I think appearance has a really big role to play. Yes, thank you. Um, in the last um, uh, couple of minutes here, if there are no any other questions, and again, if anybody has any questions, please do unmute. And um, but I would just love to hear what you what you see as high priority next steps for your research group. Irene, go ahead. Yeah, that's that's a very good question. So. Uh, I think one of the things we were, we were thinking about, and uh, you know, like if you think about next generation treatments and what's happening and where treatment stuff is going, I think the long acting um, injectables are very exciting. And, um, you know, but, you know, they, they have their own challenges. And I think it would be interesting to see how we can, you know, uh, bring long acting, particularly for adolescents um, in our setting, because that's a group that, you know, has challenges with appearance, but then also has, has you know, this, they get to adolescence and they, they, they've been taking treatment forever. So they get treatment fatigue and maybe giving them a breakthrough using this long acting would be helpful. So I think the long acting field, I don't really know what the question is yet, but the long acting field might be one, one direction to look. There's also a work around, the, our group is also doing a lot of work around mental health and trying to integrate mental health screening and uh, simple mental health treatments that could be used by lay workers uh, for adolescents who are living with HIV, but also for, for, for the general adolescent population. So mental health is also another big area that we're looking into, and particularly, uh, you know, incorporating stigma, uh, stigma interventions. And, um, yeah, I think big picture, those I know, Angela, you're doing a lot of implementation science work, and I would, I would ask Grace to jump in uh, for other ideas that uh, you may have. One thing that I'll add, and then I'm sure Grace will have many, is, you know, I mean, you talked about all of those wonderful directions. And one other area that, that we've been kind of mulling on, and that Irene and I have time next week to brainstorm about, is thinking about um, how screening tools for a variety of different conditions that adolescents or children living with HIV might um, have at a higher rate than at the unexposed um, and uninfected level of the population, if screening tools are used, what types of services can you refer to? So for example, for youth who are living with HIV who might have higher rates of neurocognitive deficit, what types of um, screening tools can be used? And then who do you refer to? And what do those referral pathways look like? How successful are they? What's the geographic distribution of the availability of those services? Are there non-specialist services that could be delivered within routine health settings or within home-based settings to support these adolescents and youth to thrive as they're growing up? Grace, do you want to add? You, you both have done such an excellent job covering all the areas of interest. Um, you know, there are many things in this space that are a little bit out, out of direct alignment, but, you know, thinking about um, 
some of the cognitive outcomes, neurodevelopment, and there's still interest in long-term advancing cure, HIV cure agenda, and what that would look like, which, you know, is very aspirational and uh, there's a long way to go, but keeping that on the, the horizon is important. And then a lot of co-infections, TB and other co-infections uh, that they still work to do in this population as well. Thank you so much. This was just such a terrific presentation. Really appreciate it. And I'm going to turn it back to Su Suzanne to close. Thanks, everyone. Hopefully, we'll make this a yearly event. So we'll see you all next year. And for our Grand Rounds participants, we'll see you all next week.